Daniel mentioned while he was singing, you know, Friday is once again another tragic day in the history. Um, I don't know, some people might be still feeling the after effects. And, you know, sometimes you kind of wonder, you know, why this, all these things happen. You know, uh, the one thing that I am for sure is that, you know, it's all, I, I, I don't believe that everything works for uh, the better. Uh, I don't know what's, you know, the outcome that's going to happen, but uh, the one thing that we do need to know is that we live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful world. There's sin in this world, and because of sin, bad things happen. But let's just see where God's will is and what His purpose is. So all we can do is just pray. Let's pray for the families. Let's pray for the people that were affected. And I had a chance to talk to the leaders this morning. And, you know, I'm sure those who have kids, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine what the parents might be going through. You know, I, I said I don't need to build the elementary school every, every day, thinking that that's the safest place. Uh, that's the safest place that, that a kid can go to. But even that, you know, it's, it's uh, not, not the safest place. So, uh, let's just really pray. It's, it's, it's tough to uh, be up here to speak, but, and especially with the tragic, but let's just continue to pray for the families. Uh, just want to kind of go off of what Peter spoke last week about peace. Uh, Especially coming to the holidays next week, I'm sure a lot of the families that were affected a couple of days ago, you know, how will they find peace? How can they find peace at a time like this? And the only answer that the world needs to know about peace, the only answer that hopefully they will, the families that lost their child will receive this week is the message of peace. Peace that only God can give to them at this moment. The peace that only God can give you at this moment. So I just want to kind of talk about, and you know, when Paul was talking about Philippians, about that peace, what generated that peace? What was it that allowed him to find that peace? What was it that Paul felt to say, I rejoice always? And again, I rejoice. What compelled Paul? What drove Paul? What was his attitude for saying such a thing? And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit today. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, verse 22 to 26. Philippians Chapter 1, verse 22 to 26. And this is what the Word of God says. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall not choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convicted of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. And lastly, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, Lord, as we come before you, Lord, may we truly receive your presence, Lord. May we Feel the spirit that's in us, Lord. May, may, may the spirit guide us and teach us and open our hearts to receive the message. May we learn uh, today's message and may it be applied to our lives so that truly we know what it means to live this life. We lift the, the search to you. We ask for your uh, blessings. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once again, I said, you know, what compelled Paul to say, as what Peter talked about last week, about the peace? How did Paul receive this peace? How did Paul uh, have the peace in his heart? Well, the very thing was, the very first verse that I 
that the Bible says in verse uh, 22. It's for to me to live is Christ. Now I want all of us to say that together. I want you guys to say it. Say it together. One, two, three. For, for to me, me to live is Christ. Christ. No, it's got to be better than that. Come on, one more time. For to me, me to live is Christ. I want, to say, I want you to say it one more time. I want you to really hear the words when we say it. Right? One, two, three. For to me to live is Christ. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? For to me to live is Christ. You know, when we talk about Paul, we can, tell, we can say that Paul is one of the greatest heroes in the Bible. I mean, we can say that great, but Paul was one of the greatest apostles. You know, when we think about Paul, we should remember, like, the great example of faith and courage that he showed upon us. We should see, when we look at Paul's life, we should see how he lived his life sold out for Christ. And how he lived his life through the power of of the Holy Spirit to change the world. As Peter kind of mentioned last week, when he wrote the Philippians, one of the prison epistles, Paul was in prison. He was in prison writing this letter. And it's not the prisons that you and I know today where they have TVs and they can smuggle cigarettes and different things that you, you know, the prisons have today. It's not luxury. In fact, the prison that Paul was probably placed into was you probably had to be lowered into this ditch, this dungeon, where there's no walls, where there's no light lights. He was in the despair. He was in the pits. And while he was in jail, yet he still had the peace. We can see that because in verse, in verse, uh, the first verse in verse 18, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. He's saying, I am, I am still rejoicing when I'm writing this letter. I'm still in peace with God while I'm still in this prison. And I will continue to be joyful. He probably, he probably was beaten. Well, we know that he was beaten. We know that he was tortured. We know that he probably was, probably, you know, in, while he's in prison, he's going to be very cold and hungry. Not a very good place to sleep. But the Apostle Paul had a very clear and focused purpose. And that purpose, the very clear, focused purpose, was from his mouth, from his words, when he wrote down the Philippians, was for to me, for to me, to live is Christ. Do you understand that? When you say that, doesn't that, doesn't that bring some emotions to your heart? As believers in Christ, for to me, I don't care what situation is happens in my life right now. For to me, I don't know, I don't care what the, the, the financial problems I'm having or the family problems I'm having. For to me, right now, as I live, is for Christ. That's the most important thing, is that you are living this life for Christ. It is this purpose, this very Statement of Paul was the reason why he was able to have that peace. It was the very reason why he was able, after he got beaten, after he was in jail, after all the things that happened in his life, after all we read, all the whole New Testament, the reason why he says, I am rejoiceful, I am joyful, is because he knew, he got it. You see, before Paul became Paul, we know that he was Saul. Now, can you imagine all the friends that he probably knew before he converted? How much ridicule he probably got from his friends? How many people said that he was a traitor? I'm pretty sure he lost all his friends that he once had. But see, Paul got it. On the way to Damascus, when he received Christ as his personal Savior, from that day forth, he knew that his life was in Christ. He didn't look back. He didn't look back and say, oh man, I wish I had the luxury that I had. Because he, he was one of the higher religious leaders. He probably had money. He probably had a home. He probably had all these great things. No, as soon as he accepted Christ, he knew what was for. He knew what was must be determined. And that was to live this life 
sold out 100% to Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book called The Life of Jordan, and this is what he says. That sentence is not only a statement of apostles' true experience, but also it is a standard of judgment which confronts us with the most thorough test of our Christian faith we will ever encounter. Every person who professes Christ as Savior must grapple with this question. Quote, can I honestly say for me to live is Christ? Paul endured all these things and more for the cause of Christ, for the cause of his life. Is living for Christ priority in your life? Does living for Christ, does it affect your work? Does it affect your decisions? Does it affect your priorities? I think daily we need to be reminded, we need to challenge ourselves every day and look in the mirror and be honest and say, can I live my life today for Christ? But what does it mean to live in Christ? What does Paul say to live in Christ? There are three things I just want to share with you today. The first thing is to live in Christ means to live in a union with Christ so that he becomes your all in all. It means to be in union with Christ. There are several other Bible verses, other translations, and I'm going to give you several, what, what they kind of translate as living in Christ. And the God's words translation says, Christ means everything to me in this life, and when I die, I'll have seen more. Another translation says, to me, the only thing important about living is Christ, and dying will be profit for me. Another says, for to me, living is for Christ, and dying is even better. For living to me seems simply Christ. And if I die, I should merely gain more of Him. Another translation said, For so far as I am concerned to be living both as to my very existence and my experience, that is Christ. And to have died is gain. What Paul is saying to live in Christ means that Everything, all, the, every knowledge, every knowing, every loving, every serving, every glorifying, every enjoyment, every enjoying thing that you do must be in communion with Christ. Your relationship, your, your, your work, your fellowship, your serving, your, your families, everything must be communion with Christ. Everything must be surrounded in Christ. Living in Christ, what it means that that we live with our first and central aim in life being to know and glorify and know and enjoy our Savior. It means serving Him and doing all that we can for Him. It means to set a watch on our thoughts and our actions and our words and to ensure that we are always glorifying Christ. Why is Paul so motivated to live for Christ? Because he knew one day he will meet we are all going to one day stand before Christ. And we'll be all judged for accordingly what we've done on this earth. As believers, that's what we have to look forward to. So, Christ, so Paul knew that one day his whole life would be accounted before God, the Almighty. And he did not want to be in a place where, where he wouldn't hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. That motivated Paul to live for Christ. Paul was motivated to live for Christ so that others can come to know who Christ is. He was motivated to live for Christ because the appreciation of the price of his redemption. Have you ever stopped and to say how thankful you should be for what Christ done for you on the cross? Have you ever appreciated what God done, what God has done for your salvation? These are the motivating factors to Paul why he should live for Christ every single day. The concept of being in Christ was so vital to Paul's understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. In Romans 6, 10, 11, he says, 
For the death that he had died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive in God, in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is the believer must be in union with Christ. Every single day of our lives, we need to grow in our experience the reality of knowing what it means to be in Christ, to live in Christ, to have fellowship with Christ. What that means is growing with Christ intimately. It's to grow in Christ intimately. Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ. That's what Paul's saying again in Philippians. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in the sufferings, becoming like Him in death. Paul said it right there in Philippians again. That his whole desire is to know Christ intimately. And if you want to know Christ intimately, then you got to understand the price that Christ paid and the suffering that he went through. It means that growing to love Christ with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. Mark chapter 12, 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. If you look at that verse, that's every being part of the whole person. Everybody has, we all have this parts to our body. We all have this wholeness to our body. We have the emotional side. We have the social side. We have the intellect side. We have the spiritual side. We have the physical side. This verse targets every single part of our whole body and says that, that you have to love God with it. So with your emotions, you have to love God. With the intellect, you have to love God. With your social life, you have to love God. With your physical, you have to love God. And most importantly, with your spiritual, you must love God. It means, submitting, it means submitting all my thoughts, emotions, words, and deeds to Christ. Colossians 1.10 so says, Colossians 1.10 says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Living in Christ means Every action, every words, everything that we do, we must be careful. Living in Christ means to grow in experience and having Christ as my all in all. Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is no Gentile, no Jew, no circumcised, no uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. For Christ is all and is in all. Our Christ is all. We all we take Christ, every bit of Him, to live for Him. Every aspect of our life must be centered around Jesus Christ. Every, like I said, everything that you do must, Jesus Christ must be in there. When you make your financial decisions, Christ needs to be there. When you're in relationships, Christ needs to be the center. Even when you go partying with your friends, Christ needs to be in the center of it. Even when you do have your own downtime, you do things on your own, Christ needs to be there. But we know that living for Christ is a process that will never really fully be realized in this life. That's something we have to realize that living for Christ we can never really 100% attain. That's why Paul says again in Philippians 3.12, he says, Now that I have already obtained it or have already become, no, let me go back. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press in order that I may hold of that which also I was laid hold of Christ Jesus. Even Paul said that he is not perfect. Every day you and I will be tempted We'll be tempted with the lust of the flesh. We'll be tempted with the lust of the eyes. We'll be tempted by, by pridefulness of life, as 1 John 2.16 tells us. We'll be tempted by those. But we must, as children of God, focus every part of our being to strive for that prize, to win the race, to keep pressing on, as Paul tells us. The second thing is to live Christ means to exalt Christ. They're everything that we do. We 
we must exalt Christ, not just have communion with Christ, not just be in union with Christ, but we must exalt Christ in everything that we do. In verse 20 it says, that with all boldness Christ shall even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. Paul says it in Philippians 1.20, with all the boldness Christ shall even know now as always be exalted in my body. What he's saying is that Christ must exemplify everything that you do. In the common language about glorifying, basically what it means, you've got to make God look good. You've got to make God look good. Yes, we know that Christ is almighty God. And we might think to ourselves, how can I possibly exemplify some of that powerful? I read this illustration here. It says that think of Jesus as being a distant star. He may be more brilliant than our own sun. But to the human eye, it's just a dim speck in the sky. Some of you probably know that this last couple of days was the uh, Gemini uh, sky, the stars falling at night. Anybody see any falling stars in the nights? Just one, two, okay. But, to, but for the stars, it's distance away. To the human eye, it's just a little speck to our human eye. But we know how splendor and how bright those stars can be. But that's the very nature of Christ is. To the world, he might be some speck. To the world, he might be somebody that's far distance away. We as Christians need to be that telescope. We need to bring Christ closer to the world. We need to bring Christ closer in our world so that other people can see Christ in our lives. This is exactly what Paul was enduring what he, what his whole heart passion was. Look with me again in the, if you look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, For I know that through your prayers, prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ this will turn out for my deliverance. That's a very interesting statement right there he says right there. What I want you guys to understand is the word deliverance the word deliverance, if you translate it into the Greek, literally means salvation. Most people think that when they read this, that Paul was saying to the Philippians, pray for my deliverance. Pray that I may get out of this prison. Pray that I may be free. Pray that I might not have to endure this, this craziness in this jail cell that I'm in. Pray that I don't have to be cold anymore. Pray that I don't have to be hungry anymore. But this is not the deliverance that Paul was talking about. In fact, look what verse 20 says. As it is my eager expectation, hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but the full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. So Paul was willing to be, he was willing to die in prison. He wasn't asking deliverance from prison. He said, hey, if I go before Caesar, I'm, I'm going to be ready. I'm, 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 I'm going to be here whether I live or die. So what was this deliverance that he was talking about? Well, this deliverance, this word is the very same word that we see in Job 13, 16. In Job 13, 16, it says, Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. This is the exact same words that Paul quoted. He quoted Job's words. If you read again, it says, Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul said it in verse 19. He was saying the very same words that he said that was said in Job 13, 16. And in that context in Job, the word deliverance was basically saying, Job was basically saying that, you know, all his friends and all his people, even his wife, were cursing at him, right? What but Job wanted was to be saved from being a hypocrite. He didn't want to be found blameless. He wanted to not be found like a, a, a person that, you know, Basically what he's saying is he doesn't want to be shameful. You see, what Paul is saying here was, I want to be delivered from that I do not put shame to my Christ. I'm going to go before Caesar. Pray that my deliverance, pray, what he says, pray that I will not be hypocrite to my Savior. Pray that on my knees, if my head is about to be cut off, that I will not reject my Savior. He said, I'm praying for that type of deliverance. I don't want to put shame to my God. 
I don't want to show no regrets on living this Christian life. Paul's passion to be with Christ and to exalt Christ needs to be the, that, that very nature, that very passion that Paul had needs to be the passion that we have as Christians. It means that when we exalt Christ, we should never bring His name to shame. And a lot of us still, we bring Jesus' name down. We bring Jesus' name to shame by our attitudes, by our words, by our behavior. How do you use your eyes? Do your eyes tempt you lustfully? How do you use your ears? Do you fill in with yourself, your ears, with, with godly music? Do you fill it with filth? I, I talked about a couple weeks ago about cussing and using profanity. Do you listen to gossip or slander? How do you use your tongue? How do you use your hands, your feet, your face? How do you use your body for purity or sensuality? What about your personal appearance? Do you dress to be seductive or to attract attention? Basically, do you exalt Christ in your life? To live for Christ means to exalt Him in everything that you do. Everything. Even when no one's looking. Even when you're at home by yourself, are you exalting Christ? And the next time you're home alone and you're tempted and you feel like nobody's watching you, sit down and pray and say, God, let me exalt you. Next time when you're with your buddies and you know what you're doing is wrong, Send a simple prayer and say, Lord, help me to exemplify. Help me to exalt you in my life. I want us to start thinking. I want us to start knowing that we don't have a free ticket to heaven. Just because you know you got saved doesn't mean that you should be able to live your life as you please. Far too many Christians just want salvation and say, yes, I got a free ticket. That's fine by me. And you've probably heard stories, and you've probably heard Bible teachers tell you that, you know, one day, the reason why we try to live this life for our Lord and Savior is to bring glory to our God. But yet, that does not register in your mind. You know, you can care less about glorifying God. The last thing is to live for Christ means to, be, means to die to selfish desires in order to love and serve others. Listen, Paul desires to check out. Look at his verse. Look at the very words that he says right here. He says, to die is the gain. And he says it again. If I die, so be it. Paul knew that it was, Paul knew that it was better to die and to be with Christ in heaven. He had no fear of death. He'd rather be with Christ. He'd rather be with his maker. He wanted to Leave this world of the, of the sin of this place and, and, the, and the dirtiness of this world. He was ready to depart and to be with Christ. But he realized that the Philippians and others needed his ministry. He realized that his job was here to still serve. Look at verse 24. Look what it says. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul says, look, I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. But no, I know God has called me to do more things, to serve others, to witness, to save more people for the cause of Christ. So he goes on verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, he's saying to the Philippines. In verse 25, convinced of this, he says, look at this, he's very sure. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul knew his purpose was to be here and to serve others, not for his selfish desire. Paul didn't say it here, I'm on this earth so that I can get the things that I want. I know God called me to be here so I can do what I need to do in this life. 
God called me to be here on this earth so that I can achieve my goals. No, what Paul said here was, I know I'm on this earth because I need to see further your faith. I'm here to be your servant. I'm here to serve you. And this is what we all must grasp, is that when we are here as believers, we are all servants. We're all here to serve each other. But you cannot serve each other until you deny your own desires. This is what it means to live in Christ. This is the reason why Paul was able to have the peace that he had. This is the reason why Paul was able to say, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. It's because his whole life, his very nature, his very purpose, his very being, his very calling was that of Christ. Christ alone. My question is to you is this. Are you living your life in Christ? Does everything about you, does everything that says, says about you, does it reflect that of Christ? And that's the challenge that we have to make while we are here on this earth. As Paul says it again, it's a process. We do it little by little every day. But don't get caught or trapped in the devil's schemes and the temptation that he throws at you. Keep your eyes focused on the Lord. And once again, this is the reason why Paul says it. He knows that he's going to mess up. He knows that he's going to have some troubles. I mean, he says it. That he's, he's got his sins like, Lord, the, I've got the thorn in my flesh. He knows there are going to be troubles and temptations. But what does he say? What does he say afterwards? He says, Lord, your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. And we got to thank God every day for his grace. And because of his grace, that's why we should live more and more to live like Christ.